Well, I don't know what your favorite programs were, TV programs, when you were a kid, but one of mine was the old program, Candid Camera. Remember Alan Hunt and Candid Camera? And uh, the, the, the premise of Candid Camera was creating these bizarre situations that innocent people walked into not knowing they were being set up and then watching, letting the cameras watch to see what in fact did they do. Uh, fortunately, those days are not all behind us. There's still folks doing those kinds of stunts. And uh, I ran across one that actually has some relevance to what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, I just thought I'd let you watch it. Well, it's a funny skit, but it would be a sad reality if you really were a person who was that unaware of what your true situation was. Hang on to that thought as we move through our passage this morning. Let me just kind of tie some things together. Last week, we've been working our way through the book of John, this series called Magnificence Among Us. And last week, we were in John chapter 7. And you may recall verses 37 and 38, which were really the key statement that Jesus makes he says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. I talked about this water festival that was part of the larger festival that was going on in Jerusalem. And that the, in the water festival, the high priest took this golden pitcher and he carried it up to the temple, followed by a great procession. And when he got there, he poured the water out, the contents of the pitcher, poured it out over this rock. And it was to symbolize, memorialize the miracle that God had done in bringing water from the rock for the people of Israel as they're out in the wilderness. And I suggested that that ceremony provided a, a backdrop, a context, for Jesus standing up and crying out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. In other words, Jesus is saying that the, the water that you long for to meet your deepest needs... I am that source. I am the one that God has sent to provide for your needs. Now we're going to pick up this week, starting at John chapter 8 and verse 12. But John uh, chapter, actually verses 7, 53, down through 8, 11, is the story we have of the woman who was caught in adultery. And you recall that these Jewish leaders brought her to Jesus challenged him saying, what should we do to her? The law says we should stone her. What do you say? And of course, they're trying to entrap Jesus once again. And Jesus just quietly defends this woman, forgives her, and tells her to go and sin no more. Uh, there is in your Bible, if you're looking at it, uh, you may notice some extra text notes around it. If you have the English Standard Version, you'll see you've got little double brackets at the very beginning and at the very end of this account. In the NIV, this account is in italics. The New American Standard, it's in brackets with a text note. The New King James Version has a text note. And you may be wondering, well, what is that all about? And uh, there actually is a, a broader conversation that needs to be had about that. For the sake of time, I've put an insert into your bulletin this morning that talks about what is the unique issue pertaining to that story. 
Um, I believe this is a true story from the life of Jesus. It, it matches everything that we know, uh, the way that the Pharisees tried to entrap him, the way that Jesus uh, consistently confounded their attempts to do so, and the way that he gave forgiveness to people that society saw as unforgivable. But uh, if you're looking at those, I think it's important to understand what the textual issue is regarding that passage. So I will leave that with the insert. I want to take us to John chapter 8, verse 12, because I believe John's intent was to put these two things tightly together. And he keeps our focus on the celebration events surrounding the temple. Besides the water festival, there was another impressive part of all of these Passover festivities, and it was a celebration that was called the Illumination of the Temple. And the Illumination of the Temple, uh, it, it had its uh, center in the court of women there in the temple. And as you came into this court, one of the outermost courts, there were these large lampstands, those four golden pillars you see there are actually giant lamps. Uh, some people think that they were, well, scholars differ, but they figure they're probably 75 to 86 feet tall, these four giant lampstands. And during Passover, each night, they were lighted. And you can imagine, especially in a day before electricity, um, I've been in some third world countries, and when it gets dark, it gets really dark. I mean, people have candles, they have little lamps, but it's dark. So you can imagine what an impression it made when these giant lamps were lit in the temple. The, the light could be seen all over Jerusalem. And, and then a huge party would happen there in the court under the light of those giant lanterns. D.A. Carson describes it like this. Men of piety and good works danced through the night, holding burning torches in their hands and singing songs and praises. The Levitical orchestra is cut loose, and some sources attest that this went on every night of the Feast of Tabernacles, with the light from the temple area shedding its glow all over Jerusalem. With that backdrop, then it takes on some additional significance when Jesus speaks again and says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. What that, what that illumination of the temple was supposed to commemorate was the fact that not only had God provided water in a barren place where there was no water, but God had led his people in a place where they didn't know the way. The story of the, the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night and, and those giant lanterns blazing in the night were to symbolically remind Israel that God had led them with his light. And Jesus stands up and says, I am the light of the world. You'll note that Jesus doesn't claim that he's just going to show them the light. That is what great thinkers and spiritual leaders have claimed since the beginning of time, that if you follow me, I will show you where the light is. If you follow my teaching, my system, I will take you to the light. But Jesus says, I am the light. That's bold stuff. It's unique. John the Baptist was a contemporary of Jesus. He was also a powerful spiritual leader. Uh, he was a revivalist. He was anointed by God. Thousands of people went to hear John, to be baptized by John. That's John the Baptist. And he had a tremendous influence. In fact, he was so influential that after John the Baptist was put to death, by Herod, and Jesus had become more popular and more known and displaying his works, his miracles, his teaching. Uh, Herod, who had actually had John put to death, began to fear that maybe John had come back to life in the form of Jesus, basically come back to haunt him is what he was afraid of. That, that is how significant and how respected John's ministry was. And yet, John the Baptist, for as respected as he was and as influential as he was, he was very clear that he was not the light. John 1, taking it out of verses 19 through 27, I've abbreviated here. This is the testimony of John. I am not the Christ. Among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. The next day, he, John the Baptist, saw Jesus coming toward him and said, 
Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. John was clear that he was not the light. He said, I, I've come to point you to the light, but I am not the light. John made sure that his own disciples were clear on that. John had those who followed him closely, just as Jesus had disciples. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples who heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Well, who were the two disciples? Well, one of them is easy to find out. We're told that it was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. However, the other disciple isn't named, which seems a little odd. Why name one, not the other? Who is this mystery disciple? Well, when you read John's account, there is a mystery disciple that shows up throughout here. We find that Jesus, hanging on the cross, appoints someone to care for his mother, and it refers to the disciple whom he loved. Again, no name, just the disciple whom he loved. John chapter 20, after the resurrection, a woman runs to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, about the resurrection. Well, who is this mysterious disciple whom Jesus loved? Most commentators agree that that mystery disciple is John himself. John never is actually named in the gospel that he penned. And so if that's right, then the apostle John before he became a follower of Jesus, was first a follower of John the Baptist. And, and he was one who heard John the Baptist say, Behold, the Lamb of God. And he, along with Andrew, began to follow Jesus. It adds some extra meaning when you get back into John chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. John the Baptist. The apostle John would say, I know this man. I, I was with him. I, I knew him. I was one of his followers. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light. See, about the light. He wasn't the light. He's bearing witness about the light. That all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. John the Baptist was clear. John was clear. Jesus was clear that Jesus alone and uniquely stood in the place of being the light. What is Jesus implying to say that? Well, like God's provision of light, the pillar of fire, to lead his people out of slavery and bondage in Egypt and to lead them to freedom, to a promised land, to take them through a dark place where they didn't know the way, Jesus is saying, I am that light. I am the one, if you want to walk out of bondage and move toward the promises of God, I am the one to follow. And you'll note he doesn't say that he is simply the light of Israel. The, the ancient pillar of fire in the wilderness, that was just for Israel. That was just to guide them through the wilderness. But Jesus says, I am the light of the world. You go back to Jesus when he met the woman at the well. Remember the woman in Samaria, the, the despised, the, the outcast, the, the half-breeds the Jews wanted nothing to do with? And Jesus spends time there, not just with her, but with the people in her village teaching them. And the statement that people make after they had spent time with Jesus was they said, He is the Savior of the world. They understood that there was a big religious divide between themselves and the Jews, but when they listened to Jesus, when they saw Jesus, they said, this man is not just for the Jews. He is for all of us. It takes us back to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus, in his own words, comes full circle back to this and says, I am the light of the world. Maybe you've picked this up as we've been going along, but you could really take every scenario that John has chosen to record in his gospel, and, and you could begin by reading the first 18 verses of his gospel. 
Read John 1, 1 through 18, read the account. Get to the next account, go back, read John 1, 1 through 18, read the next account. Because John is constantly referring back to that preamble. He keeps reinforcing and reinforcing and echoing and building the themes that he laid out in the very beginning of his book. What is this metaphor of light? I suggested at the outset of the series that I think John would have made a great photographer. Photographers love light. And that's what photography means, photosgraphos, to write with light. And, and that's what photographers are about. And they, they try to compose their picture. They, they uh, ex exclude the extraneous things to focus on what they want the viewer to see. And they, they check the lighting, and, and they check the, the positioning, and, and all of that is how they make a great image. And then when they've taken their images, they go through the images, and they choose the specific images they want to share and show to others that best tell the story. And I said that this is really what John has done with his gospel, is he's reflected on his life walking with Christ and what he wanted to communicate about who Jesus really is. Out of the stream of Jesus' life, he clicks the shutter button on various scenes, and he says, this picture, and this picture, and this picture communicates what I'm trying to say about who Jesus really was. And then he lays those pictures out for us, and, and he begins to build and reinforce the image he wants. And as you move through it, Jesus becomes brighter and brighter. It becomes clearer and clearer who John is saying Jesus is. The other thing you see happening is that also, in contrast to Jesus being brighter and brighter, you see the darkness getting darker and darker. You see the, those who oppose Jesus moving from just being skeptical to being argumentative, to trying to entrap him. And now we're at a point where we know they are actively plotting for his death, to eliminate him. And so that tension is rising as we move through the story. Why light? Why is light the metaphor that John is choosing? Well, light is what lets us see. Both what is good and what is bad. God himself is described as a being who lives in unapproachable light. In other words, he is the source by which all else can be seen, and he is the one in whom no darkness, no evil can hide or be present. Darkness is the domain of hiddenness, of disorder, of confusion, of isolation. To be a sighted person and suddenly be plunged into darkness is to be left completely disoriented. To live in darkness is to live life tenuously. I used to work in a dark room in college, a photographic dark room. And if you were new in the dark room, uh, it was a very disorienting experience to feel your way around trying to know where everything was. Uh, the more you work there, the more you learn to place things in the right positions so you could orient yourself once the lights went out. But but to live in darkness is to be disoriented. I heard a comedian recently lamenting the fact that as he was getting older, he was getting more nearsighted and he was getting forgetful. And he said, you know how it is when you put your glasses down, you can't remember where you put them, and now you can't see? He said, you spend the next 20 minutes walking around your house gently touching things. Where did they go? Spiritual blindness leaves us in that same kind of predicament. To, to be spiritually blind is to live life tenuously, not certain where you're going. To live life disconnected from our creator is to leave us groping for answers. Who am I? How should I live? What should I live for? What is my purpose? Does life even have a purpose? Years ago, I worked part-time for L.A. Sheriff's Department. We had a guy that headed up what was called RACES. It was all the volunteer ham radio operators that were activated during emergencies. And uh, uh, this guy was a great radio operator. He also was blind. And the story goes, I was not at this party, but I certainly heard about it. Uh, they were at the Christmas party, and this guy was having some appetizers before the dinner started, and he commented on how good he thought the celery was. 
And one of the other deputies there, with the warmth and compassion that only one cop can show to another, said, you're eating the centerpiece. <laughs> the Bible says that left to ourselves, alienated from God, we are people who are stumbling blindly, grasping things that we think will satisfy us only to find that we've taken hold of the wrong things running into obstacles that wound us and we didn't even see them coming. We create images in our head of what we believe is going to be the big picture, how life should go and how we should live, and only to find out when we get to the end that we chose the wrong path, that we were misguided. Like the blind man in the sketch, we make our spiritual home sometimes in a place that actually is a place of ruin and we don't even realize it. You know, when you're in the dark, you can come to some very unusual conclusions. I was reading recently about uh, some theories on where everything comes from, uh, what's going on here. And, and one guy, you may know him, Neil deGrasse Tyson, he's a well-known astrophysicist. He hosted the television series Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. And uh, because in his worldview, he has already excluded the idea that there can be a god, and yet, at the same time, he sees all the evidence of intelligence and organization and purpose. He has a theory. And his theory is that, quote, it is highly likely that we're living in a simulation designed by aliens of a far advanced civilization. <laughs> he puts the odds at 50-50 that our entire existence is a program on someone else's hard drive. The reason why he thinks that could be true is because the more we learn about the universe, the more it appears to be based on mathematical laws. Now, he's not alone in this. Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla and SpaceX, thinks the same thing. Now, now why would you come to a conclusion that you're nothing more than a simulation on somebody's hard drive? Well, it's because in the darkness you're trying to figure out how to explain all of this. And, and the one who could give me the most light is the one that I've already said, I'm not going to consider you as an option. Where did we come from? The Bible says that God created us. We're not just part of an undetectable but highly sophisticated computer simulation residing on the hard drive of some alien. We are the creation of an all-powerful God. Why would people who are so intelligent in so many areas grasp at ideas like this when the answer seems so obvious and simple. Romans chapter 1 says that there are men who, by their unrighteousness, suppress the truth. Right? The, the truth is right there, but, but we tamp it down, we push it away. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You're right to look at the world and say there is mathematical complexity here that makes no sense if there's no intelligence behind it. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. They began to think that we were a computer simulation on an alien hard drive, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Some blindness is congenital, some is chosen. All of us begin in darkness. Our first inclinations are not God-centered. But sometimes, even as we begin to see the evidence for God, we choose to actively suppress it. Eyes closed tight, fingers in our ears, humming loudly. I don't want that to be true. Here's the amazing thing. The, the modern materialist that would deny God and the ancient Jewish rabbi who rejected Jesus, both are struggling with the same issue. They, they don't want to seriously consider that Jesus may be who he claimed to be. Both of them end up in darkness, and yet, what does Jesus do? Jesus stands up in the middle of people who he knows are already plotting his death, and he makes the offer wide to all. He says, I am the light. If you will come to me, you will be accepted. You will be loved. You will find your way. 
One of the advantages of having run a business for years that did medical and surgical equipment is that there's a lot of cool stuff you can repurpose for other uses. And in my wood shop, I have a surgical minor procedure light that is fantastic for woodworking. Um, light is so important. If you're working on something with detail, something complex, you want to turn the light on to see what's going on. When you're lost in the dark, you turn on the light. And to come into Christ's light means that we open our hearts, our lives to him, and we invite him in, and we say, I am here for you to guide me. I want to see the world through your light. We embrace his way as our way. His definition of reality becomes our definition of reality. Who he says we are, we accept as our identity. The world will tell you all kinds of things about who you are, or about how guilty you are, or what your worth should be based on, or how worthless you are. And, and Jesus says, here's how I see you. When you come into my family, I see you as forgiven, as loved, as a new person, as a person with meaning and value, and I've prepared work for you to do. And to walk in his light is to say amen to that. I agree, Lord, that is who I am because that is who you have made me. Where he says to go, we go. What he says to flee, we flee. And amazingly, the trip gets better once we do that. Sometimes we're afraid to really give it all to God, to really follow Jesus fully, because we are afraid, I think, that it'll somehow put us into a, a constricting tube that is going to eliminate so many great options. Which is kind of like saying that turning the lights out in my living room will help me have more options about how I walk through it. Well, I'll have more options, but, you know, 80% of them involve falling over something. I was reading a story just last night from uh, Rosalind Picard. This was in this month's issue of Christianity Today. She is a professor at MIT, and she said this. It just caught my eye. She had grown up as a skeptic, as an atheist, but began to think that maybe there really is a God, began to search it out, and came to a point where she was willing to pray. After praying, Jesus Christ, I ask you to be Lord of my life, my world changed dramatically as if a flat black and white existence suddenly turned full color, and three-dimensional. That is to step into the light. Well, what Jesus says results in a lot of debate. A lot of debate about who he is when he says it, because these Jewish leaders aren't buying it. And the Pharisees said to him, you're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Okay, it's not just good enough for you to say that. I mean, anybody could say anything. So we don't trust your testimony. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. In your law, it's written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father, the other, who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your Father? Jesus answered, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. The Pharisees quite fairly say you need more proof for that. You, you need some witnesses who can back up this claim that, that you are the son of God, that you are the light, that you are the water. Well, the problem is Jesus is on kind of a different plane. To have witnesses, you've got to have folks who were around when it happened. And, and if what you're saying is, I am the one who was before all things and who created all things, there's kind of a limited pool of witnesses who could back that up. Jesus says, well, I'm one, and my father's the other. He knows I was with him. He knows what happened. That's one of the problems when you're the uncaused cause. You know what that term means, right? It, when you talk about where did it all come from, we have to say, well, where did it all come from? And if you go with a completely materialistic viewpoint, you have to say that everything we have, everything that is, all intelligence, all matter, all science, all of that, came from nothing. There just was nothing there. And, and then for no reason, something was. And then it turned into all this. Or you have to say that there was someone who was there, who was not caused, who is the cause of everything else. 
And, and Jesus is basically saying, and John has said at the outset, Jesus is the uncaused cause. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and all things were created by Him. And so Jesus says, I have witnesses, it's just we're not on your playing field. Well, so how then are they supposed to figure out who He is? I mean, He's right about the witnesses, but how is that supposed to validate it to them, really? He says, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. This is the same language Jesus used with Nicodemus. He said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. What does he mean by being lifted up? Well, there is double entendre going, in, going on here. I, at one level, to be lifted up, as we know, had implications for the cross. When you were crucified, you were lifted up on a cross to die. And what was going to fully reveal who Jesus was would be the resurrection. But to get to the resurrection, you first have to go through the crucifixion. And so the lifting up of Jesus was, in fact, a crucial step for them to come to know who he really was as the resurrected Lord. But the lifting up is also a statement of, of faith and exaltation. To, to be lifted high is to be honored, to be exalted. And, and in the resurrection again, those who saw him. You remember Thomas? Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe Unless I can see the nail prints in his hand and put my hand into the, the spear mark in his side, I won't believe. And then Jesus appears to Thomas. And he says, okay, Thomas, here it is. Here's my hands. Go ahead. Here's my side. Have a feel. And what is Thomas's response? Thomas is to fall on his knees and to say, my Lord and my God. It is to lift him up to know who he truly is. Many who heard him believed. They didn't fully understand. It was going to be a while before they fully understood what that meant, but, but they're beginning to place their faith in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Some of us are skeptics by nature. I think I fall into that category. Skepticism, cynicism comes really easily for me. And, and you hold things at arm's length. You're, you're not sure you really believe it. And that's legitimate up to a point. Uh, that's part of how we avoid just being gullible and believing anything that anybody tells us. You, you take a minute, you take a deep breath, you check it out. You say, is that really true? Skepticism, though, can become its own kind of trap. I shared this yesterday at the conference. Skepticism and cynicism can become just a bad habit. In fact, it can become a, a, a defensive strategy, if you will. Because if you want to make sure that you never look foolish for believing the wrong thing, one way to protect yourself is to treat everything as stupid. And if you just treat everything as stupid, that somehow puts you in a higher position. You've put yourself above all because it's all dumb and you don't believe any of it. But the problem is if you go through life never committing to anything, never believing anything, never investing your life in anything, you won't go anywhere because you're just forever holding everything at arm's length. Jesus says, if you'll abide in my word, if you'll close the distance, if, if you will, yes, do the research, think through the issues, but, but if in fact I am who I claim to be, then close the distance. Put your faith in me. Let me be the one who lights and guides your path. And then you get the benefits of the light, of a real relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, some of us, I think, have spiritual ADHD. We, we kind of flit here and there. 
we, uh, we're all about Jesus on a Sunday morning. We think it's cool. We like the music. You know, the message was, was nice. The guy showed kind of a cute video at the front. That was good. Uh, you know, so that was fun. But, but come Monday, we're back in that other world. And, and we just kind of blend in there, and we go with that, and we go with the values of the world around us. And, and we flit here, and we flit there by whatever feels good in the moment. And, and we know that our faith isn't strong. We know that we haven't fully committed ourselves to Jesus Christ. C.S. Lewis, in an essay called Reality or Substitute, said this. If we wish to be rational, not now and then, but constantly, we must pray for the gift of faith. For the power to go on believing, not in the teeth of reason, but in the teeth of lust and terror and jealousy and boredom and indifference. I'm not sure, after all, whether one of the causes of our weak faith is not a secret wish that our faith should not be very strong. Is there some reservation in our minds, some fear of what it might be like if our religion became quite real? I hope not. God help us all and forgive us. Jesus says, abide in my light. Don't be some kind of a spiritual moth that flits in and out. But come to me. Follow me. Make it real. You know, the book of Genesis begins with this statement. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John picks up his own gospel with that same idea. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, and all things were created by him. John is obviously echoing Genesis 1. He says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Without form and void, there's a great couple of Hebrew words behind that. It is tohu wabohu. Go ahead, take that home with you. You now have a Hebrew phrase you can impress your friends with, tohu wabohu. It's a play on words. Uh, Maybe a better English translation would be helter-skelter. It it was dark and it was helter-skelter. But then God steps into the chaos. and, And what is the first thing that God does to straighten out the chaos? He speaks a word and he brings light. Well, we know the story. God creates a garden for man. Man starts about abiding in God's garden communing with God, but then man loses the garden. Why? Because he chooses not to abide in God's word, not not to obey what he had been told to do. And what happens outside of the garden? Well, once again, life becomes tohu wabohu. It becomes helter-skelter. Man's history is filled with tohu wabohu. Wars and oppression Betrayal, discord, religion itself, reduced to a twisted record of idolatry and self-debasement, persecution, manipulation. All of it is rooted in, in the misplaced confidence of characters who themselves are lost in the dark, like the blind man with his house in ruins, attempting to stake their claim with no real sense of their true condition. These self-inflated religious leaders who are busily plotting in the darkness to kill the one who was himself the source of light have no idea what they're doing. How do we relight our world? Well, the first step is to allow the word to illuminate us with his words. First step is to close the distance with him. Like, Like that professor to say, Lord Jesus, I'm willing to let you be Lord of my life. And then we abide. We stand still. We stay in the orb of that light. We don't flit in and out. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. We're going to share communion together this morning. The symbols of the bread and the cup are really a graphic reminder that though Jesus was the light, he was surrounded by an intense and deadly darkness. By people who in their pride and their arrogance literally wanted him dead. They wanted his body broken. 
They wanted his blood shed. And from that perspective, these elements could be seen as an enduring reminder that darkness triumphed. 2,000 years later, we still remember that his body was broken, his blood was shed, darkness invaded. But John, in his opening prologue, proclaimed this. He said, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus was lifted up and he died, but that was not the end. Easter is coming. It's the joyful declaration that that the darkness did not overcome because he is risen. And Jesus could say with anticipation, with joy, He said, I want you to take these symbols, this symbol of my broken body, of my shed blood, not because it is a reminder of defeat, but because it is the path to victory. The victory that I have won for you in my death, in my life. In taking these elements, we lift up the Lord. We lift up the one who is lifted up on a cross for us. We look on the one who died for us, The one who in his death and by his resurrection has given us light and life. In taking the bread and the cup, there is not only the reminder of his sacrifice and and a celebration of his resurrected life, but I think there is also a commission. It's a call. It's a call to follow him. And sometimes that means sacrifice. Sometimes that means brokenness. But when you're following the one who is the author of life, the one who is the light, the darkness will not overcome. I'd encourage you to take a few moments to pray, quiet your heart. As you're ready, take the bread, take the cup. And when we're finished, the worship team will come up and close our service.